Okay, great. Thanks very much, Nick. Thanks for your introductions. And yes, myself and Scott will quickly go through this brand new program, um, which has been, was part of the Agricultural Transition Plan when that was published back in November last year. And of course, we've been saying it's been imminent ever since the Farming Forum series of webinars back in March too. And it's been imminent for more months than we had anticipated. But here it is. It has actually launched. It is a real thing. Um, it is a new program. It's new for us. It's new for DEFRA too. Uh, we have posed several questions seeking clarification back to DEFRA on things we've spotted. And I dare say some of the questions you may have after our presentation, uh, we may have to go back to DEFRA for some of those too. But you know, that's really useful for us uh, as well as for DEFRA as well. So it's a programme which is being delivered through all of England's 10 national parks and 34 areas of outstanding natural beauty, which collectively cover 25% of England. So it's quite, quite a large area of the country which has been covered by farming and protected landscapes. And part of the reason is because these protected landscapes provide a range of different habitats from moorlands to limestone grasslands, woodlands, wetlands, and so on. Uh, we have a lot of rural communities within a lot of these protected landscapes. And of course, if you look at the Cotswolds as an example, you know, we, we are a very popular visitor destination, as many of you noticed, particularly since the ending of the, of the first and second lockdowns, you know, the number of people's coming in. And of course, increasingly, you know, we have more knowledge of how important accessing landscapes and wildlife is for health and well-being as well. It's a programme which will run from July now, this month, uh, to the end of March 2024. It's not an agri-environment scheme. It's much, much more. So you know, don't be blinkered by thinking it is something like countryside stewardship because it can do all sorts of things which countryside stewardship cannot do. We can go much further in supporting nature recovery. We can look at mitigating the impacts of climate change and getting the Cotswolds much more resilient to that for the future. It can provide opportunities for people to you know, enjoy and access the landscape and enjoy it in the cultural heritage and of course support nature friendly sustainable farm businesses in actually helping to deliver farmer led nature recovery in the Cotswolds as well. It's open to all farmers and land managers within an AMB or national park but each program is delivered locally by each AMB or national park so in the Cotswolds is being delivered by the Cotswolds national landscape. It can support activity on other land outside the AOMB, um, but it has to be shown how that proposal actually benefits the AOMB and supports the objectives of designation and the management plan too. To be able to apply, you must be responsible or have, uh, basically you must be managing the land uh, subject to the application and have control of the proposed activities or written consent of it too. We'll come back to some of these later on. Other groups can also make applications, but they have to do so in collaboration with a farmer or land manager. So, I mean, that, that, could be, that could be a wildlife trust. It could be a parish council, for example, working with some landowners and farmers within the area. The program covers four main themes, climate, nature, people, and place. And I won't go into the what's in the boxes there because Scott's going to develop these very shortly. But the other important thing here is that projects must also support the priorities within the Cotswolds AMB management plan and, of course, you know, the primary objective of designation too. So Scott will also touch on that and there is guidance on the website to, to cover this. So Scott, I think it's over to you for the next series of slides. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Um, just check everyone can hear me, I hope. Uh, show it if you can't. Um, so yeah, just gonna take a closer look at the outcomes that are supported by the programme um, nationally, and then look more closely at how they link in to our management plan for the Cotswolds. And that's something that applicants will need to demonstrate as Mark just explained. And also we're gonna look at a few specific examples um, just to give you a few ideas of what's possible, but by no means the full breadth or depth of it. So the first theme um, is climate. 
Okay, so we've got the full list here and there'll be things lots of people are quite familiar with, more carbon is stored or sequestered, flood risk is reduced, so that could be things like natural flood management or other natural climate solutions. The third point, which I think is a really interesting one, is about you know, generating a better understanding among farmers and land managers about what they could do uh, on their land to benefit carbon storage and reduce their emissions. And the last one is a very general point, landscape is more resilient to climate change, so we have all these different measures working together. I think it's really important to demonstrate here that yes you can see how some of this relates the capital works on the ground but the funding can also pay for things like training perhaps for a bit of research things that will project development things that will get you further along the journey towards being able to deliver those outcomes on the ground. Um, next one please Mark. Okay so nature Again, things I think a lot of people will be quite familiar with is effectively the Lawton principles. So more areas for wildlife, greater connectivity between them. So that's our ecological networks, our nature recovery networks being improved. Um, existing habitat better managed by the biodiversity. So, you know, understanding what you've got and making sure it's being managed well. And overall, hopefully not only, you know, halting the declines in biodiversity first and hopefully then generating an increase. I'd like to just point out here as well, again, like with the last slide, you can look at this as an opportunity for doing work on the ground, but also think about, you know, what projects could be done, which would increase that understanding and awareness amongst the farming and land management community about how they actually go about doing this stuff. So it can be, you know, you've got capital grants, but we can also cover revenue. So that's things like management and other things like that. Okay, ne next one, please, Mark. Okay, so the fourth theme, people. Um, so more opportunity for people to explore, enjoy and understand the landscape. That's something that ties really clearly into the second purpose of um, our management plan for the Cotswolds. The second point, I think, is a really good one, too, though. You know, we're really keen that we're not only enabling people to access the countryside in ways that we're all perhaps familiar with, but actually increasing the number of opportunities and ways that people can come here and enjoy it and trying to reach out to more diverse audiences, perhaps people that we don't see as much around uh, coming and enjoying the area that we would like to uh, and we'll look at an example of that later on um, and the last point I think is a really good one especially if you're farmers out there thinking about you know how do I engage local communities or the wider public with what we're doing some of the challenges we've got and this can be sort of delivered through FIPL as well farming and protected landscape sorry not supposed to abbreviate it um, so the greater public engagement in land management for example through volunteering thinking about what can we do on our farm to get people here understand what we're doing what it's all about I think that's a really exciting one actually and uh, the last theme please mark place okay so again you know really key thing about the protected landscape is the special qualities that first point really alludes to that the quality and the character of the landscape is reinforced and enhanced and it's really important to think about those two things the, not just the character of the landscape but the quality of what's there how well it's being looked after um, historic structures and features are conserved enhanced or interpreted more effectively so we can think you know quite sort of established conventional ways we might go about doing things like that. Um, this last point though is, is another interesting one, increasing the resilience of nature-friendly sustainable farm businesses, which in turn contributes to more thriving local economy. Um, you know, it's quite a different offer here, but this could be things like developing a, a product which really identifies with the fact that it's from this landscape, from the Cotswolds. I think we've, we, the, the guidance has been developed around this last point recently as well, and we think things that come through this one should also be demonstrating how they deliver some of the other outcomes as well, at least one other outcome. So that's the, the, the outcomes which are supported across all the protected landscapes in England. Um, and now we're just going to look a little bit more closely about how they correspond to outcomes and policies which are in the management plan. And that's something that you'll need to do in applications that come to us and that you'll be scored against. So next one, please, Mark. And, oh, sorry, just one more quick slide here. Just some really clear, you know, obvious examples, again, put forward by DEFRA of the sort of thing we can do here. Uh, next one, please, Mark. I think we can skip over that one. So, yeah, here's the, the key thing. So not only are we supporting those outcomes, but then your projects need to deliver those outcomes in ways that are appropriate for the Cotswolds and then the, the purposes of our management plan to conserve and enhance the natural beauty and to increase understanding and enjoyment of special qualities. Um, and there is separate guidance where we've kind of broken this down to make it easier for people to sort of see how these outcomes link to things in the management plan. And the next few slides just give some examples of that. So next one, please, Mark. So here's an uh, indicative idea for a project which is really focused on climate. I should stress at this point, projects don't need to just focus on one theme. Ideally, they'll focus on multiple themes. 
Um, but for the purpose of keeping it simple for this presentation, each one we're just going to give an example under each theme. So this one is working with the Environment Agency and Catchment Partnership. A group of farmers collaborate on a series of natural flood management interventions appropriate to the landscape. And that's the really key thing here. We want to see not only are they doing the, the interventions, but they're done in a way that's appropriate, that fits well with the Cotswolds. So it could be things like leaky dams, restoring meanders, tree planting, wet nutrition, and so on. So the, the supported outcomes, flood risk of induced landscapes more resilient to climate change, they're the obvious ones. And you can see how that really clearly links into policy CC6 in our management plan for the Cotswolds on water. And so very simply through that, you can demonstrate that it's delivering against national outcomes and our locally focused ones. Next slide, please, Mark. Um, so an example for nature, creating new wildflower rich grasslands um, by oversowing pasture and reverting an area of arable with locally protected wildflower seed connecting three unimproved grasslands, including an S, a triple SI. So nationally supported outcomes, greater area of wildlife, rich habitat, greater connectivity, okay, it probably ticks all the, all the nature outcomes and very clearly links into outcome nine in our management plan. I think the key thing to draw out here is that it's, you know, the focus is on wildflower rich grasslands, something we've lost a huge amount of. In, in the Cotswolds and we're working really hard to put back as much as possible so you can see this is a really clear and obvious example of the sort of habitat based project which is appropriate for the Cotswolds and of course there will be many others but this one's just a particularly clear example. Next slide please Mark. So people, okay so another example here working with our wardens, um, group of neighbouring farms create disability access routes for wheelchair users um, through the use of permissive path connections. We're already in conversations with some people about permissive path opportunities. This is a really nice example. I'd love to see better facilities for wheelchair users to be able to get out there and enjoy the landscape um, and it really ticks the supported outcome and are more opportunities for more diverse audiences to explore and join and understand the landscape and again really clearly links into outcome 13 on access and recreation in our management plan. And the last one please Mark. Okay, so place, again here, this one's focused on outcome seven in our management plan, dark skies, group of farmers collaborating with local community to reduce the impact of artificial light using dark sky friendly lighting and shielding. And again, this supports the idea of the quality and the character of the landscape is reinforced and enhanced and more quite specifically linking into outcome seven in our management plan. Um, and again, place, you can imagine it would go in many, many different directions. I should stress these are just really specific examples just to give you a sense of the sort of things that are possible. But hopefully you've seen from the type of outcomes that are supported that there's real breadth and depth to what's possible to put forward and propose under this programme. And, and ideally you'll be thinking about how you actually link up things which are going to benefit climate, nature, people and place together. And the more outcomes uh, a proposal um, promises to deliver against the higher it will score when we come to assessing it. I think that's it, Mark. I, don't, I think that's, that's back to you. Great. OK, thanks very much, Scott. Right. So a bit more detail now and perhaps the more important bit in terms of the funding and so on. Um, hopefully a lot of these, if there's three slides on funding, hopefully these will answer a lot of potential questions. But I dare say there's things we, we've not thought of. Uh, and so please do ask when we get there. Um, so funding, we can fund up to 40% for items which there is a very clear commercial gain for the farm business. If there's some commercial gain, but the proposal mainly delivers public goods, then it's up to 80%. If there's no commercial gain, then you know, it could potentially go up to 100% funding as well. But what about match funding? Well, strictly speaking, it's not a requirement, but it is encouraged because obviously it will increase your scoring. And uh, in, when you're making the application with us. So, you know, quite a, quite a useful thing to sort of think of. And that match funding, yes, it can be money, but it can also be perhaps putting a value on your time and you know, things you're doing towards that particular outcome as well. Now, funding can range up to a maximum bit clay or a maximum um, bid, if you like, for 250,000, quite extraordinary sums of money here. Uh, there's a minimum of two and a half thousand. Now, 
the minimum is something we've put on locally and there's two reasons for this really one it will sort of help discourage lots of applications for very small sums but actually uh, the Cotswolds National Landscape has a scheme called caring for the Cotswolds which will fund things up to two and a half thousand pounds so it's sort of just a is no point sort of duplicating that really hence that at minimum level you can be in other schemes. So you can have an agreement where that's countryside stewardship or whether you're looking at the SFI pilot and so on. But the key thing, of course, is double funding. We cannot double fund things. So you obviously can't be paid twice for the same piece of work. We do have forms from DEFRA to make sure that's the case. So there will be checks when it comes to things like Country of Stewardship, Growth Fund and LEADER. Um, there may also be checks in the future, actually. So future schemes which are yet to be launched. One, for example, is the Farming Investment Fund. You know, if you apply to that in the future, there may be a backward check to this program, as there might be for LEADER as well. Now, there's also a clawback thing. If you've been in LEADER, you'll be familiar with this as a, as a terms and condition. So there can be clawback on non or partial delivery. We've already posed a question about what about derogations to DEFRA, and we are currently awaiting uh, guidance on that. Um, and hopefully we'll get that back, I thought, hopefully pretty soon, actually. Um, where you are applying for projects which can also be funded through countryside stewardship activity, we are stuck with paying the same as the countryside stewardship rate. So a classic example in the Cotswolds is dry stone walling. Obviously, you can't apply for dry stone walling if it's in your countryside stewardship agreement. But if it isn't or you're not in a CS agreement and you apply for dry stone walling, we are stuck with that same rate. Um, when it comes to dry stone walling, of course, yes, um, it's not a lot for the Cotswolds, but we have got our fingers crossed that <laughs> there will be some applications for dry stone walling because it is such an important uh, feature of the Cotswold landscape. If it's not something which is paid for or, or has a, an equivalent uh, option in countryside stewardship and a payment rate, then funding will be offered based on quotes. We cannot fund existing legal duties. I guess there's no surprise there. Likewise, conditions of planning ex, uh, consents. Um, a good example is public rights of way. So you know, we can't fund the replacement of a style with a style because that is the minimum legal duty. But of course, we can quite easily consider replacing that style with a gate. Funding where you're looking at quotes will be based on the lowest quote. It doesn't mean you have to actually accept that quote yourself, but you will have to make up the difference. So it's really important that if you are going out to quotes, make sure that the specifications are strong and clear. So that lowest quote is the one that actually stands the one is funded and you're not ending up having to add more money to it yourself. An interesting one, I think, particularly for some of the smaller farm businesses out there is self-delivery. So, yes, we can do that through farming and protected landscapes as well. And the guidance here from DEFRA is use the rates in NICS, the Agricultural Costings Book or the Agricultural Valuers. You're probably familiar with all three. Or, of course, get three quotes and you can compare then your cost of self-delivery against those. Tenants, as already been mentioned, will need landlord consent and you also need to have control for the duration of commitments. Um, now, there's a slide later on which points out commitments for capital items. There is a commitment to keep things for five years, so you have to bear that in mind. You can't apply for works which are covered by your tenancy agreements, or sorry, required by your tenancy agreement to be more specific. Now, uh, we were asked this question last week. Um, can tenants and landlords apply for the same holding? Uh, the answer is yes, but obviously not for the same things. And of course, it does raise the question about sort of maybe better if you collaborate and perhaps put in a single application as well. Commons are also eligible. So an owner of a common can apply, uh, as can a group of commoners who have an internal agreement as well. 
Specialist advice can be covered where it's part of an agreement, but I guess the key thing here is that what we're really driving at with farmer protected landscapes is delivering themes and outcomes on the ground. So specialist advice can be part of that application where it is still delivering those outcomes. You can also apply more than once. So you're not limited to one application to this program uh, in any given year or over the three year life of the program either. And we can also do multi year awards, but all projects must end by March 2024. The other key thing here is that this is a program driven by financial year. So where there are multi year awards, it has to be broken up into what will be delivered in that at any given financial year and each of those elements has to be delivered by the end of March of that financial year as well. So how to apply? Well, we are encouraging you to come and talk to us. Contact us by email or phone and uh, you know, we'll either just discuss simple proposals on the phone um, if it's something a bit bigger or needs a bit more knocking around, we will arrange a site visit and come and meet you and talk things through. Once we've done that and we feel that it's a pretty good idea and um, you know, worthy of an application, we'll send you an application form. Now, there is an application window for this first year. So it, now it's running from now until, the, until January next year. So you have a few months to get in some proposals with us and hopefully some application forms as well. But don't forget that sort of financial year driver when it comes to actually undertaking the work. Each of the applications will be assessed. Now there is a scoring system uh, which has been given to us by DEFRA and yes 40% for the outcomes that's the biggest one but there are also scores there for value for money, sustainability of the project and the legacy it will leave and how likely the project will be completed in time. Applications for over £5,000 to fund will be judged by a local assessment panel. We have set that panel up. We've got 12, 12 folk on that panel drawn from right across the Cotswolds. You know, we've got an eye to geography, but also expertise on that as well. And applications for under £5,000 can be approved by a senior team member at the Cotswold National Landscape. So those smaller applications can actually have a very quick turnaround. After the agreement ends, well, this is a it surprised us. Um, there's no requirement to maintain any natural uh, cultural access activities after the agreement ends. Uh, bearing in mind it's programs for three years, potentially some of these activities may only be running for a year. Um, but you must maintain capital infrastructure, fences, gates, etc., for five years from completion date, and likewise maintain any machinery assets. If you're thinking of a firewood processor, for example, for five years from the purchase date as well. This is almost the last slide. So there is further information. Uh, it's on our website. We put the link there. We'll make this presentation available. So don't. Don't worry about trying to scribble it all down. There's also more sort of general information on the government's website as well. And you can also sign up for the Farming Protected Landscape blogs too. We've also got um, the future. Uh, we've also got our sort of um, database, which I think many of you signed up to already back in March. A few more of you have to recently for this presentation today. So you know, we'd encourage you to also get your neighbours to sign on to that as well because we'll be forwarding and sending out updates as the programme progresses. And that is the last slide. So I think um, oh, back to you Nick for the uh, Q&A. Um, thank you Mark and Scott for those uh, presentations and I'd just like to point out to anybody who uh, joined uh, joined this uh, after it had started that A it's being recorded and, and B anything that you miss will be available to you through that recording. Um, so at the minute we, we just have a, a couple in a uh, couple of questions so we've got um, an improvement in multiple benefits to soils, biodiversity and livestock welfare is provided by well-managed hedges. Can we link with ag colleges, et cetera, to encourage management of taller hedges, brackets, 
say, four cuts into an A-shape every two years rather than annual bow-shaped cutting. So, Nick, is that, is that a question about getting back to agricultural colleges? It's, uh, I think, promoting better uh, head cutting management, which is already promoted through stewardship and uh, other organisations like FWAG and uh, Wildlife Trust, etc. But I think the question is suggesting, can we educate, uh, I guess, new entrants through colleges? Is that, is, I think that's what uh, Kate was uh, aiming at. OK, I mean, yes, I mean, the farming protected landscapes can support training and education as well. So if anyone is thinking about having some training sessions on their farm, then yes, you know, I think that's something that we would love to see. OK, um, the next one is village green and open space designations treated the same as commons. Yes, so a, 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 the owner or the manager of a village green can apply to this program. Okay, thank you. And as uh, Steph Emerson said, it would be helpful if you could put the project, uh, example project slide back up, please. I think there was more than one, one example, but uh, what have you got in your box of tricks there, Mark? Uh, which, yes, I think there was, there was about four or five, I think, project example slides. Um, was there any particular one? So, Steph, is this uh, one that you want to see? No, sorry, I had to dash out the room, so I missed them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll, we'll put the presentation on our website. Okay, thank you. Also, um, just to note, if, if you go on our website, there is a document, links to the management plan on there, which has under all the outcomes listed with all their corresponding outcomes and policies in our management plan and examples of projects more than we presented today on there. So if you go to our website, that document's already up there. Thank you, Scott. Um, so a couple more questions just come in. Um, so uh, one of two from, um, from the same person. Research projects were mentioned. Um, can you give an example of the kind of thing that would be considered? And then the second part is working in partnership with other organisations. Can you lead your own applications as well as partner with others? Uh, the, the second question first. Yes, uh, you can be in partnership and you can apply on your own too. And I expect we're going to see that with a couple of farm clusters who may be putting forward a collaborative application for individual farms within their well, we know there's a couple of individual farms in a, in a cluster who will be talking to us about this. Uh, Scott, research projects, I'll pass that one back to you. Yeah, I think, I think with all of this stuff, if, if, if it's being done in collaboration with a farmer or land manager and it's tied to a particular site or series of sites and, and, and has the, the written sort of consent and involvement of those farmers and land managers and is leading towards something which may be fundable through as a grant through the programme or perhaps another source of funding and finance, then it could be eligible. Uh, but just as a standalone sort of piece of academic research, it wouldn't be. It does need to be tied into a particular site and farmer or land manager. Thank you. There's, uh, there's more questions coming in. Um, if you want to put uh, land into wildflowers, do you have to keep animals off all year round? Um, I think it depends on your start point. So if it's something which the Glorious Grasslands program normally does, which is over sowing existing pasture, then no, we probably actually need animals on there to trample the seeds in for one thing. Um, if you're starting from a base of uh, arable reversion, then I, again, I, I think there's so many variables in this it would probably be best to talk to someone like Harvey or Fwag or Naturaling to get the guidance specific for you. But it depends, I think, you know, how quickly it comes through. I saw Ian actually on, listed on here. So maybe um, he can maybe make a comment on this. If you're there, Ian. Ian Boyd, <laughs> that is. <laughs> Oh, Mark, um, yep. uh, if he, Ian, are you there? I'm here. Am I, am okay. I going through? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you, Ian. You can, right. Um, 
I don't think there's any need to keep livestock off a wildflower meadow. It certainly, but the point about it is it, it wants to be grazed appropriately. Great, thanks, Ian. And I, I could just add where we've been doing work to uh, build uh, species diversity on, on some historic banks and, and meadows, seasonal grazing and certainly removing them for the flowering and seeding period. But uh, we view livestock as quite an important part of the management of, of, of those uh, species rich areas. Uh, so the next question. Um, can I apply for retrospective funding for disabled access on, promose, uh, on proposed permissive path? I have bought seed and the fencing, but haven't yet completed the path. Sadly, we cannot fund things retrospectively. I think that's actually an important point, um, come to think of it, and I should have put that on the slides. Um, it's really important that you have to wait for the go ahead. You go to the uh, proposal, will go to the panel. Uh, you know, they will hopefully say yes, and then you have to wait for the formal go ahead from us before you can actually start the project. So yes, we, we can't do things retrospectively, sadly. Thank you, Mark. And we are looking uh, through your team to move as quickly as we can once the applications are submitted, aren't we? we we've got early autumn meetings scheduled in terms of uh, the panel. So uh, hopefully um, subject to appropriate applications being made, we'll, we'll, we'll be getting some responses out. Uh, uh, Scott, what, what does that look like in terms of the first tranche of timings at the minute? So we're hoping to have our first um, assessment panel meeting where we'll be assessing projects at the beginning of September. Um, so anyone that can get an application in before then, it will be assessed then. And that's if it's uh, an application above 5,000. Anything under 5,000 that comes in before then, we, we may be able to assess even, um, even more quickly. So it's possible that if you submit an application in, um, in time for that first meeting, you could have a decision by early mid-September and be able to start work um, immediately. Uh, Thank the, you. The assessment panel meetings will be every six to eight weeks after that in cycles. So we're going to be t turning over think, turning through things pretty quickly. Thank you. And just to remind everybody, it, it is a three-year scheme and our calendar year it, uh, it finishes in March. So we're in tranche one of three. March is our, uh, our switch over date and uh, we're, we're certainly open for business and encouraging people to uh, to look at uh, worthwhile schemes, get get applied, but don't feel that you're going to miss the boat. If you're not ready, there will be a second and a third bite of the apple, so to speak. Um, so there's nothing in, uh, more in Q&A. Um, do you want to open up uh, for a, a verbal submission? Uh, Nick? Yeah. Yes. There, there are actually a couple of other questions in Q&A, um, which have uh, sneaked oh, through. Sorry. I think yeah, that's sorry, okay. Uh, yeah. um, there's, there's a question here about uh, would this scheme support diversification of business development pro projects? Yes, farming and protected landscapes can do that. And as it's commercial, then it's up to 40%. And there's another question here about, uh, we're about to lose rough, approximately 50 roadside ash trees just die back. Um, replanting in the same place outside of current schemes, would roadside planting be eligible? Yes is a simple answer, but it goes back to this thing is that you need to be in control of the land. So if it's in your hedge or just inside your hedge, then yes, you know, give us a call. Okay, how will outcome be assessed on the scheme? Outcomes, uh, oh, monitoring, yes. There we've got, well, yes, yeah, like a lot of things, it's bureaucracy. And if you think forms, or application forms uh, are a bit of bureaucracy, you should see the forms we've got to fill in when it comes to monitoring over the next <laughs> two or three years of the programme. So yes, uh, and of course, you know, there's these things about maintaining things, uh, capital assets, for example, for five years as well. So yes, there will be um, some kind of assessments. I have to admit, we are still we're still working our way through some of the guidance from DEFRA on this. I'm just wondering there as well if the question is 
relate to that or whether the outcomes in the application form and if it's about that assessment. I don't know if you want to clarify, David. Uh, no, thank you very much. That's absolutely fine. Thank you for that. Um, Mark, did you do Steph's answer for farms who, who were in the growth or leader? Um, um, right, so if you've been in growth fund or leader, you can apply, but it obviously it has to be for different things. We can't double fund. You know, that is that basic rule. So if it's a new proposal you've got, then give us a call. Okay. I, would, I would just add to that. I think the word of caution of people are thinking about this grant for get, uh, getting large chunks of funding for new bits of kit or you know, expensive infrastructure, that it's not particularly well suited to that kind of thing. So by all means, get in touch and talk to us, um, but it's not like leader in that sense. I think just word of caution. Okay, next one. Uh, more questions come in. Uh, would projects that provide access for limited numbers of people, e.g. a space where therapy can be conducted in nature or training can be offered in rural crafts or tree houses, which are available for commercial rent, be eligible or is the focus on general access? I think the examples given that question, um, if, if they're considered to be a farm diversification project, then it can be considered by farming protected landscapes. I'll just okay. add to it as well, I suppose. I think the other way of looking at it is if you look at our policy under sustainable tourism in the management plan, mm. so that will give you a little bit more of a direction that, okay, it's... It, or, or diversity of access. So for example, bunk barns could be interesting because it provides more affordable accommodation, which is hard to find in the Cotswolds. Whereas if you're looking for money to renovate a sort of luxury sheet, it's, it's probably, it's not the right kind of thing. Thank you. Uh, next one. As one of the objectives under the theme of place is increasing farm business resilience, would this scheme support diversification and business development projects? Yes, the, the program can, um, and if it's a, if it's commercial, then it can be funded up to forty percent. But of course, it's still got to do people, place, climate, uh, nature, and you know, the objectives of the AMB designation and management plan as well. Okay. And also, just to add to that, there is running in tandem as part of agricultural transition the Future Farming Resilient Fund. Oh, yeah. um, and so if people are looking for, for some the advice on the development of their farm business, that might be the first port of call. And we're going to be trying to work closely with them where they're, they're uh, getting clients in the Cotswolds. So they might work with the, the farmer, develop you know, th their business plan, and elements of that might be suitable for farming and protected landscapes, and hopefully we'll kind of hook up in that way. Thank yes, one, one of the local advisors has already been in touch as well. Okay, so uh, the next one, are project management costs eligible, um, e.g. farmer, cluster, coordinators, catchment, partnership managers? It is eligible, um, but the bulk of the cost, if you like, has to be on delivery. But if you need support to actually design, plan and deliver, then that can be part of the application. Thank you. The next one, is there, uh, is there any funding for... Cotswold sheep as not viable to keep them commercially. That, that must speak be. speak on that. <laughs> Please do. You put yourself back on mute, I think, Kate. Sorry, sorry. Um, I'm Kate Le Map. I'm a board member, and in discussion with the Rare Breed Survival Trust, we're looking at how we develop a joint project with the CNL and the RBST and the breeders to see how we can uh, make a really good bid. Thank you, Kate. So, I, put, um, I put my email address on the chat, actually. Shall I do it again? I put it to Judy. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I think to one. So oh, sorry, no. I, think, I think to uh, try and answer the question more specifically, I, I don't think we could just simply fund someone to buy a small flock of Cotswolds. Um, but if someone's looking to develop or buy a flock of Cotswolds to do other, uh, provide our other outcomes as well, then that's probably going to be a better fit. 
Yeah, I think we're flagging up here. Don't forget that things will be scored against sort of sustainability and legacy of the project. So you have to be thinking about the long term, even though we, we won't have the sort of resource to, to monitor things after the, the program comes to an end, we will be scoring applications against that sort of future view and how something will, will last into the future. So it's important to think about projects in that respect. Thank you. Uh, the next question, does the £5,000 limit uh, refer to total spend or just the 40%? The, the five thousand. If you're thinking of uh, an application which is five less than five thousand pounds, it is actually the sum you are applying for. So if you are applying for less than five thousand pounds, that's uh, that that's the break point as to where the decision is made. So if forty percent, if you're after forty percent of something and it's less than five thousand pounds, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, the, the next question similar. Is the sum of 5,000 the cost of the entire project or just a grant contribution to it? So I think we've covered that off. It's the grant contribution to it, correct? Yes. Um, the next one, uh, how much is total funding for the, this first year available to the Cotswold AONB stroke Cotswold National Landscape? As, as no one knows. <laughs> Yeah, good question. Um, the funding profile over the three years of the programme is a little bit out of skew. There's nothing much we can do about this. So actually, the biggest annual sum we have is this financial year, which also happens to be the shorter year because the programme didn't launch until the beginning of this month. The fund we have available for this financial year is just shy of a million. Thank you. Uh, would the grant support collaborative deer control uh, slash coals, uh, question mark, a model could be based on a headage payment, uh, bounty payment? I think, yes. I mean, deer, man yeah, deer management is something which we desperately need in many parts of the Cotswolds. I don't think farming protected landscapes could fund just that but if it was deer management to uh, make woodlands more sustainable more productive then that may be the way to think about it okay thank you uh, will hedgerow planting and fencing projects be popular with the fund question mark uh, would the costs of creation and maintenance be covered? Well, first of all, uh, hedge planting uh, is something which can be covered by countryside stewardship. So we will be limited to the same rates that countryside stewardship can pay as well. But yes, it's something which the fund can consider. Okay, thank you. So... In my box, we're at the bottom, apart from Kate has uh, posted her email for any Cotswold sheep breeders that wish to make contact regarding putting a group bid together. So uh, back to you, Scott and Mark, if you want to open it up to the floor. Oh, one moment. Uh, would restore an ancient dew ponds qualify? Yes. Absolutely, that's part of place. And of course, you know, if it's next to a public right of way or you're thinking about access to it, so on, then that will obviously get uh, additional um, well, I, uh, uh, help with the scoring as well. And you know, the more the more outcomes a proposal can deliver, then the higher it will be scored. Thank you. That's it at the minute in Q and A. Okay, well, if anyone has any other questions, you can use the raise your hand function if you want to ask a question verbally um, under reactions at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to raise a hand. We've got another one in the chat there as well. Yeah, any parish and town council clerks wanted to work with land manager stroke farmers uh, as both a CNL board member and a clerk and parish councillor, I'm interested in networking. Uh, 
Yeah, great. Okay. That's great, Amanda. Um, do you want to put your email address in the chat like Kate did, perhaps, if you're happy to do that? Um, we've got some hands up now, Nick. Okay. That's, so um, let's uh, go to uh, Fred Ackrell then. Fred? Very good afternoon to all. Thank you very much for taking us through that. Uh, just recapping on the question that I asked under Steph's name uh, in the chat, which is about uh, funding for those uh, who's been through the growth and leader. Uh, the specific thing was on new projects, but I'm just wondering whether there are any limits. Previously, uh, when we were part of the EU, we had to um, stick to industrial de minimis and uh, there were uh, limits to the amount of funding we could have within uh, a three-year period. We've been successful in gaining uh, a number of grants through those projects uh, and have a large project that we'd like to put to you uh, with regard to an education centre. Um, would we be limited in the amount we can apply for because of our uh, previous grants through uh, Growth and Leader? Uh, that's a good question. There is some guidance on this in terms of, I forget what they actually call it, but I think the best thing to do is to contact myself or Scott and we we'll probably you know, look at that in a bit more detail with you. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. There's some subsidy control. Um, considerations we need to take into account. It's a new name for state aid. Um, so that might be what we'd need to look at there, I think. Uh, thank you, Fred. If we could go to Pauline Wilson, please. Hello, it's Richard here. Yeah. Um, uh, a couple of times uh, mention has been made of scoring points. Are there specific uh, operations that uh, and get a certain rating? I mean, um, is, is points, you know, uh, literally points, or um, is this just um, how you would generally value it? It's how the proposals are assessed. And uh, I don't even remember, but one of the slides on the presentation was looking at how that was actually broken down. But that's not points, is it? That, that was a breakdown, wasn't it? It is, yes. Oh, right. So it's not for specific operations, you know, plant a tree and you score so many points. Oh, no, 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 no nothing like that. Right. It's not like um, you know, getting a certain number of points for your ESA agreement. Nothing like that whatsoever. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, I can't see, uh, I mean, I could, I could see those two hands. Are there any more hands on the screen? I've got can't see anything flagged at my end. No, I can't see any others either. Well, if that's it for now, um, we are coming up to time anyway. People can always contact us at farming at cotswoldsamb.org.uk. Uh, just go to our website, all the information is there. So, um, all, all that befalls to me is to uh, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, do look up the copy of the recording if you if you want to use that as a memoir. Uh, do engage with the, uh, the the new engagement team. Um, there's going to be uh, uh, Scott plus two others and, and Mark. So there's a, at least four on that team to deal with with this exciting project. So we. We hope that you're going to come up with some exciting proposals and uh, make the Cotswold area even more special than it currently is. Um, Scott and Mark, anything finally to say before we close the meeting down? Uh, no, nothing for me, just echo those points. Yeah, please visit the website. All our contact information is up there. Um, full detailed guidance and funding criteria from DEFRA as well as links to our management plan. It's, it's all up there. Um, sign up to our farming main list. I think most of you will be already, but let your friends and neighbours know if you think they're interested. Um, yeah, and we'll, we'll put a link up to the video of this recording, which will go up on our YouTube channel, where you can see the other videos from the Cotswold Farming Forum uh, from earlier in the year as well. Thank you. And, and just to point out that the Cotswold National Landscape, the work of the, the, the large and expanding team, um, is uh, is much wider than this new scheme and please have a look at the website and uh, 
see some of the other projects that, that we're doing. It's a, it's a very large area for the staff um, and the volunteers to uh, look after and uh, farmers and land managers are very much part of that uh, care and maintenance package and, and this is, uh, this is a, a green light from the government as to how they want us uh, all to engage and to, uh, to make it a better place for everybody that, that wishes to uh, enjoy it and live in it or visit it. Thank you, I think that's, uh, that's all, from, all for now. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, everyone.